Thank you so much for that warm introduction. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you at, at RAND. I'm going to talk today about something that has unconsciously and indirectly led to a tyranny of experts. Let's call it the technocratic approach to economic development. It's the idea that poverty is really just a set of technical problems. So that, for example, for malaria, there's a, there's a variety of technical solutions. One of them involves mm -hmm. spraying a chemical called pyrethrum, pyrethrum on the, the walls of people's houses, on the inside walls of people's houses to kill mosquitoes that carry malaria. That's a technical solution. It helps fight malaria. Another technical solution might be to convert land to higher value uses, like from food crops that have low value to forestry products that have higher value. But now let me tell you why this might, this purely technical approach to development, which seems so appealing, so straightforward, so uncontroversial, might in fact be not quite that easy. So here's the story. On the and this is not a happy story. This is not like the, do not think that this is the run up to a punchline to a joke. I'll try to work in some jokes later, but this is not the happy part of the talk, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. On the morning of Sunday, February 28th, 2010, the villagers of Mubende District, Uganda, were in church when they heard the sound of gunfire outside and they came out and they found that men with guns were burning down their homes and torturing their crops, shooting their livestock, keeping them at gunpoint from rescuing their burning homes. And then the, the men with guns marched them away at gunpoint. 20,000 farmers lost their land. This happened in the guise of a World Bank forestry project. The World Bank forestry project was designed as a technical solution to raise people's incomes. Obviously, it did not work out as intended. And a couple of additional things that, where this is obviously an extreme story, a horror story, and yet there's a couple of additional things that, that are somewhat revealing of the, what this book calls the forgotten rights of the poor, that the rights of the poor are so often neglected, ignored, forgotten. So two things that happen next. One is, unlike many other rights violations that happen, this one actually made it onto the front page of the New York Times. So you would have thought that would have led to some kind of corrective response in this case. The World Bank on Twitter the next day said they would do an investigation into what had happened, which sounded like the right response at the time. It's now been four years since that, and there has never been a World Bank investigation into what happened, into its, into its own actions of what happened. That was the first non-event that's revealing of the forgotten rights of the poor. The second non-event that's revealing of the forgotten rights of the poor is that hardly anyone protested. And the last thing that's revealing is that this story is literally forgotten all by, by almost everyone except a few people paying attention uh, on the outside and, of course, the victims themselves. So this story is illustrative in that you cannot do what the World Bank has always tried to do from its very founding. The World Bank Articles of Agreement have this clause in them, that the World Bank projects shall, they shall be designed, they shall be, loans shall be granted, projects shall, interventions shall be made not taking into account the political character of the government, of the, the aid recipient, not considering the political character of the government, whether it's an autocracy that will send men with guns to implement the project, or whether it's uh, a democratic government that recognizes political and economic rights. And the World Bank seems to have the illusion that there are something called economic considerations that can be separated out and that, can, that economic considerations somehow do not include the political character of the government. Uh, that the political character of the government is not itself something that could be hindering or helping economic development. This kind of separation is what I'm calling the, the technocratic approach to development. The, the illusion that technical solutions can ignore the political system in which they operate. And what does, what does, 
what are the consequences of this? Well, first, let's get a, a couple of things clear. Uh, one is that development is not always very open about this, but development is partly a field that is making normative recommendations about how to make people better off. And we too often forget that in order to make normative recommendations, you have to state your own normative values. So, for example, I mean, I personally would consider this rights violation that I just described abhorrent in and of itself. I would consider the, the rights of the poor that were violated here, both their political right to protest what happened to them and their economic right, that is, the, the, the property right that they held, held over the land that was taken away from them. I, I, I myself would openly state that those rights are in, good in and of themselves. That the principle of freedom of choice and of consent of individuals is a value in and of itself. Now, I don't want to kind of play fast and dirty and say that that, uh, the mor that moral statement au automatically wins the argument for the rights of the poor because there could be other competing moral goods that may be there as a trade-off with some other moral, morally good thing that we're trading off. But all I'm saying is we cannot ignore the normative value of the rights of the poor, that the rights of the poor are an end in and of themselves. And that is primarily the way that pe they, the rights have spread historically, is that people treat them as something good in, in and of themselves that they want for themselves. And then, of course, the second thing that we have to consider is, are the, are, is a system based on political and economic, economic rights, is it more likely to foster economic development? Or is it maybe, maybe, is it, maybe it's the reverse. Maybe you need a, an autocrat to implement economic development, to make the hard choices. Maybe people don't care about their rights until they're at some higher standard of level, higher standard of living, high, their material needs have already been met, maybe only then. So th this is a debate that we need to have. And this one is not a normative debate, it's a positive debate. Do political and economic rights in fact facilitate economic development? They make the economic development happen, or is in fact autocracy a better system to make economic development happen? That's a debate that, that we need to have in economic development. And what has happened is that by making statements like this, by having a technocratic approach to development, we're not openly having that debate. The World Bank is not allowing that debate to happen when the, this, this article is still in agreement. So the World Bank is not even allowing itself to openly talk about the issue of democracy or autocracy. In fact, there's, uh, I, I've been following the past two World Bank presidents, President Zelik, who has held the office for five years, and Dr. Jim Kim, who has the office now. Uh, neither one has ever openly used the word democracy in a speech. Zelik, in particular, since he was there for five years, I was particularly you know, impressed that he finished a whole five-year term without ever using the word democracy. And just to make sure that I wasn't missing anything, I, I talked to the World Bank press spokesman, and the press spokesman confirmed to me that he was, he said, well, the president's not allowed to use the world word democracy. Haven't you read World Bank Article 4, Section 10? <laughs> you know, we're not, so that is not an acceptable state of affairs. This article should not be binding either the operations of people who want to promote development or certainly should not be binding the rest of us who care about development, that we should be able to openly debate whether democracy, whether individual rights for the poor are, are a good thing or not for promoting development. And the primary complaint of this book is that, that debate has not happened anywhere near enough. It has not been taken anywhere near seriously enough in economic development. Well, let me give you a little bit of history on the technocratic idea. Where did it come from and how has it held on so long so that the, this article has never been changed and the technocratic approach is really being followed by a lot of people still today? One fun thing that, uh, that authors get to do when they do uh, research for books is they get to, to do reading in areas that uh, turn out to be fun. <laughs> and one, one area that turned out to be fun for me was studying the history of the idea of technocratic development. And one thing I found is that uh, it went